Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, as I mentioned, so we'll help you to understand how to comply with the, uh, the GSPR, the General Safety and Performance Requirements. Uh, this is a presentation that I, I will do to you, uh, but if you have any questions, please um, raise that on the, on the comments and I will try to follow, follow them. Um, so the GSPR uh, is really an important piece and I hope you understand that. Uh, so, uh, and I will try to explain you why it is really an important piece because um, there is a lot of misunderstanding. So I try to introduce uh, that to you. Let me share my screen now. Okay. So uh, in terms of the general safety and performance requirements, so first, uh, for the people that don't know me, so I am Munir Alazuzi. I'm a medical device expert uh, specialized in quality and regulatory affairs. Uh, I work for big, big corporations like Johnson & Johnson, like Bosch & Long, Bebron Medical, Scientix, uh, Alpha Tech Spine, and Micromega. So uh, many of those companies are in orthopedics, in sterilization, ophthalmology. So I try to be uh, really broad in traumatology uh, and uh, after that, I founded my own company, so easymedicaldevice.com, uh, Easy Medical Device GmbH, uh, based in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, and I've, out of that, I'm also a blogger, podcaster, uh, YouTuber, uh, as some people are, are saying. Um, but um, aside of that, I'm also helping uh, medical device companies to be compliant. Uh, to place their products on the market. Uh, as I'm always saying, uh, when you have a difficult situation and you're trying really to understand uh, if uh, this uh, product is good, you are mainly saying, um, would I give this product to a member of my family? And this is what I'm doing always when there is a difficult situation. Uh, would I give this product to a member of my family? Yes or no. And if it's no, so then uh, we have to uh, pass to a next, uh, next product. Okay, um, so out of that, um, I wanted to start here with uh, the misconception related to uh, an MDR project or, or when you are starting a, a project, uh, project like that. And the, the first misconception is the fact that um, you are starting your project for CE marking with the technical documentation. Um, this is something that a lot of people are saying. Um, uh, we are starting a project. Can you write the technical documentation? And I'm saying I cannot write that because you have nothing. Uh, a technical documentation is for me like a puzzle. Uh, so you are you have a lot of pieces that you have to create first before you can assemble the puzzle within a one document, which is the technical documentation. If you don't have the clinical evaluation report, if you don't have uh, the classification, if you don't have the intended purpose, if you don't have uh, the PMCF, if you don't have the PMS, if you don't have all those procedures uh, for design, if you don't know who will be your manufacturer, I mean, you will f you will have nothing to write in the technical documentation. So first, um, the project will not start with technical documentation. Second, the GSPR uh, should not start when the design is frozen. So. Well, for example, when you are designing a product, you have the user requirements first, then you have uh, all the design inputs, the design process, the design output, the design transfer to production, etc. So when the design is, is frozen, so it's finished, um, then if you are starting to look at the GSPR, then you are finding that maybe you have missed a lot of tests that should be done, or there is a lot of requirements that you are not fulfilling at all. So uh, what I'm, um, yeah, what I'm asking you is really to uh, not really start a project, uh, or start a GSPR when everything is frozen. Um, so all the other mis misinterpretation is that uh, people are thinking that the GSPR is just a document to fill. So it's just a, we call it a checklist, and you have to fill it uh, with a lot of ISO inside, a lot of things. I will show you how to fill that also in this presentation. Um, but it's not really that. I will also explain you how I, we, you can use this GSPR checklist uh, to really lead your project and to be really compliant from from beginning. Um, if you are a drug device combination product and are regulated by a drug, GSPR is still needed because your device part will need to also comply to the GSPR. So uh, this is something that uh, we discussed um, uh, in, our, in one podcast episode uh, with Margaret Giari. Uh, so if you want to go there, we discuss really the drug device combination, what they have to follow, and the GSPR is one element that needs also to be followed there. Uh, what else? Uh, GSPR is only for MDR. So GSPR, we talked a lot of GSPR because of MDR. Uh, why? Because MDR is really the most important thing that is coming now, but it's also for IVDR. So IVDR is also talking about GSPR. 
and I will try to uh, explain to you a bit what, what it is there. Uh, so we have, as I've said at the beginning, so GSPR is not similar to the essential requirements. Uh, it's similar in the way it is written, means that it's a kind of a checklist. There is a lot of requirements and you have to fulfill each of them. But there is a lot of changes in terms of the sentences, in terms of the requirements. There is some requirements that are emerged, some requirements that disappear, et cetera, et cetera. So you cannot just take the essential requirement and just rebrand it as a GSPR or general safety performance requirements and say, I am done, I am, I am finalized. No, you have to restart the process from zero. And when, when I'm say from zero, you will see that there is a lot of requirements. So that's something that like just do. Um, so what are the GSPRs? GSPR? So the GSPR are something listed in Annex 1. So uh, and it's Annex 1 because, as we said, it's really important that you start with that. So uh, the GSPR is listed in Annex 1 of the MDR, 2017-745, and also on the Annex 1 of the IVDR, 2017-746. So you can see here, I just made a screenshot of what is what it is. But um, you can see that um, it is really a list of requirements, of requirements, et cetera. So, as we've said, it's for many called the essential requirements. And um, in the MDR, there is 23 requirements to follow. When before, with the MDD, there was 13 for the essential requirements. And with the AI MDD, it was 16. So, you see that, uh, yeah, there is more requirements if you are following, uh, following the MDR specifically. But if you are merging the MDR and DD, uh, there is less requirement together because there were a lot of requirements from MDR, uh, MDD and AM, AI MDD uh, that were a bit similar. And we'll go through some of the requirements. I will not go specifically to each requirement one by one, but I will make a summary of, of each of them. For the IVDR, it, was, it is 20 uh, topics to comply with. Um, in terms of uh, IVDR, uh, so there is a bit less, but uh, it's exactly the same thing. So you will see also on the structure, they were, there are also three chapters, and there are also the same kind of structure that has to be followed. Um, but yeah, there are different requirements because an in vitro diagnostic medical device is not the same as a normal medical device. And there is no grandfathering. So you cannot take, as I've said, the essential requirements or what you had before and just um, and just use it for the MDR. You have really to go from zero. You have really to review one by one again each of the question. You have to check the requirements and see how you can comply to that. So for me, the GSPR is really the bandmaster, the director of any medical device CE marking. If you have to start somewhere, you you should start by the GSPR. I will show you a structure of for when to how to start a project. So what is the first thing you have to do? Maybe the second, etc. And you'll see what is the place of the GSPR on that. But uh, it's uh, it's really at the beginning. So for those that um, are still not really understanding what we are talking about, uh, you can you have to imagine the GSPR as a checklist. A checklist of documents, a checklist of requirements, and you have to go to number one, and you have to see how you are complying to that. You have to go to number two, and you have to see how you are complying to that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there is, as I've said, 23 like that for MDR, 20 like that. I mean, when I say 23, it's uh, a wrong information. There is 23 official topics, but inside there is subtopics. You will see also that uh, on the labeling there is only one, which is the 20 number 23. But if you open the number 23, there is uh, 23 a 23 a 1 23 2 uh, then 23 1 a b c d etc 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 so there is more uh, more to look at um okay let's check uh, um so hello everybody so yeah hello from india so good time hello deborah from the uk thanks uh, hello barbara from the usa so hello everybody uh clare from uk also uh, so, as I've said, if you have any question from what I'm saying, so let me know, and I'll try to uh, to, uh, to answer to that. Uh, hello, Mutalib from Malaysia. Okay, so next one. So the GSPR chapter. So here is a bit of the high level of the structure of the GSPR. We have in on one side the EUMDR 2017-745, 
And inside, there is three chapters. There is the first chapter, which is a general requirement. Number 10. And number two, the chapter number two, which is the design and manufacturing requirements, which goes from number 10 to number 22. And you have number uh, chapter three, which is the uh, label and IFU requirements. And it is just the number 23. The number, the chapter one is mandatory for everybody. I mean, there is just one section maybe for Annex 16 where uh, the number uh, nine is specifically for Annex 16. But for the rest, it sh you sh everybody should follow that. Number two, chapter number two, there are things that you have to follow and things that maybe are not applicable to you. So you have to justify why it's not applicable to you, and then you can pass to the next one. Yeah, one thing is important is that there is 23 requirements, but if you, you know, for example, one of the requirements is that like uh, uh, my product supplies some energy, and if your product is not supplying energy, let's say a scalpel or anything like that, uh, then you can pass, you can say, no, not applicable, my, my, my device is not supplying any energy, it's not an active device, et cetera, et cetera. So you can mention that. Um, and then, for those that are applicable, then you have really to comply to them. Then chapter three, there is the uh, labels and IFU. I have a lot of questions from people that are asking me, Munir, um, I have my products. I need to place that on, I have, need to have a CE marking. What should I place on the, on the device, uh, uh, on the labeling on the IFU? And what I'm saying always is go to chapter three of the Annex one and they, it is really listed. You have to have the name of the manufacturer, you have to have uh, uh, information about the expiration date, you have to have et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. if you have a, an authorized representative. So everything is listed there. So no need to recreate the wheel. You just go there, you go one by one and you check if you are complying to that or not. Same, if your product is not sterile, no need to put not sterile. But if it is sterile, you have to put the sterile logo maybe and the st what, what, what sterilization process you are using. If you go now to the EUA VDR, You'll see it's exactly the same structure. It's chapter one, general requirements, one to ten, uh, to eight, not to ten, uh, not to nine anymore. Chapter two, the performance and design and manufacturing requirements from nine to uh, 19. And it's the same, it's also conditional. So there is some elements inside that maybe are applicable and some that are not maybe not applicable. So uh, if your device has no electronic inside, etc., there is a full section about that. You can, you can make not applicable because my device has no electronic at all. And the last one is the same, labeling and IFU. It's exactly explaining what should be placed on the products uh, for on the label and the IFU. So you see, I mean, I hope that you understand now that the GSPI is an important piece because it's providing you already a guidance of what you should have or not on your technical file, your dossier, your justification, etc. And you, you will put that there. Um, okay. Next step is, uh, I will make a, a deep dive, if I can say, on the EU MDR, and I will do the same on the EU IVDR. But when I say deep dive, I just tell you a bit of the sections that are inside so that you have a, a better understanding. But I will not go through each of the section and tell you uh, you have to comply like this or you have to comply like that. The objective here is really to provide you a, an overview of what is GSPR, why it is important for, for you to look at that and have a better understanding on how to of the year. Uh, uh, just a question here. Uh, Vish, v, uh, so is it advisable to start um, Annex 2 after GSPR? So I will show you how what to start um, first, if I can say. But um, most likely, yes. I mean, if you have completed the GSPR, uh, then uh, you have normally all the data, all the information that you need to build your technical documentation. Annex 2 and Annex 3 are technical documentation. So as soon as you start and finalize completely the GSPR, then um, you have all the pieces normally of the puzzle to build your technical documentation. Okay, let's go to the MDR. So the chapter one, as I've said, general uh, requirements. On these general requirements, it's really general requirements. So it means that normally it's applicable to most of your products. As I said, just the last one you see here, applicable to uh, Annex uh, 16 products is not uh, is maybe not applicable to your products. Annex 16 products is products that have non-medical device purpose. Imagine now you are having a product that is a cosmetic uh, contact lenses, or you, we use always this one because it's the first on the list. 
on the Annex 16 is uh, uh, contact lenses that are only here for cosmetic use, uh, Halloween or something to change the color of your eyes. Uh, this is becoming with the MDR a medical device when before it was not. And here there is a specific uh, requirement for that on the GSPR. So, but if your product is not part of the Annex 16, you can uh, make it as non not applicable. But first we are talking about the device performance. So, I mean, you put a device, a certain device on the market. So you have to show that the device is really performing as you are uh, mentioning that it's performing. Then we have a full section specifically about risks. So we talk a lot about benefit risk evaluation, minimization of uh, risk, uh, evaluation of the uh, side effects. You have also a full chapter or full element talking about the building of the risk management system which is mainly following the ISO uh, 971. And it's saying to you, you have to have a risk management file for each product, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, a big chapter, a big, a big element. So what does it mean? It means that first, I have to evaluate my the performance of my products. Second, I have also to evaluate the risk of my products and evaluate that with the benefit of it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's important maybe also to understand that when you have that, it means that I have to build my uh, my risk management uh, system. So for that, I will go to the ISO 14971. So for that, I will play, I will put that, 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 that in place. So if I do all this, then I will comply to this uh, requirement. There is also the performance of the device versus the patient user. So here, for example, there is maybe some requirements for usability test because maybe the device is performing well, but maybe if it's damaging the life of the user or the patient on the other side, it's maybe not a good device because maybe you didn't put the right information on the IFU or the label. Maybe you didn't thought about this or about that. So maybe some usability test uh, would be also necessary for that. But here, when you hear that, it's a kind of a brainstorming. What can you do to comply to this requirement? Um, then there is the, uh, the performance of the products even when it is transported. So imagine now you have a product, you have to, to uh, deliver it from a point A to point B. Do you think the transportation, the storage condition, etc., can damage the product? And you have to uh, identify that and to also uh, put that on your product to say, for example, it can be stored between two degrees and 25 degrees. Uh, it, should, it should be on a dry environment, etc. Et so here is the place where you have to make all those tests also. So here, this is the general requirement. So as I said, mainly all products have to follow that. Then we have chapter two, which is the design and manufacturing requirements. And this depends of your product. For example, here from the 10 the section, from the GSPR 10 to GSPR 22, there is some topics or some sections that will be discussed. Here we are talking specifically about the chemical, physical, and biological properties. We have to design the products in a way that the chemical, physical, and biological properties are uh, performing well, that they are following the requirements, that they are minimizing the risk of contamination. So if you are using a, a certain material that is maybe increasing the potential contamination of the patient, even if it's performing well, but it's also in another side um, performing, a, I mean, allowing contamination of your, uh, of your patient, then it's not a good product. So you have to show that there is no contamination of your products uh, possible. Um, you have also the CMR, so um, uh, on the, on the pro product. So here it's more uh, something for the commission that they have to place to put in place some guidance. So it's not something I will put on the GSPR specifically, but it's something that is listed on GSPR that the commission has to uh, have some guidance in terms of TALAT and of CMR. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that um, you will have to follow when they will be uh, available. Um, then the labeling requirements also related to chemical, physical, uh, physical and biological properties. Um, you have to reduce the infection as low as possible. If there is a sterile condition, you have to maintain the sterile condition for the products, uh, for the packaging, etc. If the device is incorporating medicinal substance, then you have also some requirements to follow. If it is uh, incorporating some material or of biological origin also. But as I said, if your device is not sterile, if your device has no medicinal substance, if your device has no material of biological origin, there is no specific need to uh, follow that. So you just have to put a justification why uh, it's not applicable to, uh, to your product. 
Um, then we have all the rest of the list, as I've said, we have construction of device and interaction with their environment. So it's also important that uh, you are um, also evaluating the environment of the device. We have, for example, some electronic devices that maybe are emitting some radiation or emitting some, 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 some electromagnetic uh, things uh, that can um, damage the environment, or maybe the environment can also damage the device. Maybe it's, it should not be put outside, maybe it should not be put in an environment where it's too hot, etc., etc. So you have also to evaluate that to confirm that your device is operating in every environment or if there is some restrictions also. Um, protection against radiation, uh, electronic programmable system, active devices and devices connected to them, etc. So you see the list is going more specifically in terms of certain devices. So when you are reading that, as I've said, if you see my device is not an electronic, so you can already uh, put not applicable, et cetera, et cetera. So, but you have to go through each of them one by one. Uh, general recommendation regarding then the labeling and information to be supplied to the uh, manufacturer. And here, as I told you, have all requirements to, for the manufacturer, which information he has to provide, like for example, he has to provide the packaging information, label, uh, instruction for use, uh, et cetera what information should be on the label, what information should be on the uh, packaging, uh, what information should be on the instruction for use. And here you have a full list of what normally should be mentioned there. Um, so you have to go through this list and what we are using, because the labels are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, what we are using is you are, we are using some uh, logos, for example, that are some symbols that are uh, coming from some, uh, some standards. So if you the uh, and you have also uh, following these requirements and these requirements and you are just listing which requirement you are following uh, because the auditor will ask you what is exactly the standard that you are following to put this information on, on, on the market. Uh, okay, so just looking quickly on the questions, um, uh, can we follow sheer guidelines to for talent? So for that, I don't have the specific answer to that because it's mainly the the specific requirement for talent. But uh, the commission should tell you normally for medical devices which uh, guidance should be followed. Um, I'm, I didn't check, but I, I didn't check if there is a guidance that was issued specifically for talat or for CMR. I will check and maybe I will try to come back to you uh, later about that. But uh, if there is already a guidance that was issued and that this guidance is also including uh, the medical devices inside, then yes, you have to, I mean, better to follow guidance that is already existing than uh, waiting for the medical device to issue guidance that maybe will be coming late. So uh, as soon as you see a guidance and the content makes really sense for medical devices, then use it. Uh, I will have to check specifically if there is one for medical devices, but if there is also already the cheer guidance that is existing, you have just to evaluate if your products can really apply this guidance. Okay, so um, now for the IVDR. IVDR, as I've said, it's also the same three chapters and we are going the same. I will go more quickly on this one because majority is really the same. So the chapter one is mainly the general requirements and we have the device performance again. We have the benefit risk again, the risk management again, the performance of the device versus the patient again, uh, the storage condition, transport condition again. As you can see, it's nearly comparable. It's really, they are trying really to provide the same information. There is not the number nine, which is the Annex uh, 16, because there is no Annex 16 or no product that are non-medical device within the IVDR. Chapter two, then we have here specific requirements for IVDR. So it's not like something specific for every device, it's really IVDR. Performance characteristics, chemical, physical, and biological properties, infection and microbial contamination, device incorporating material of biological origin, so the same as a uh, medical device also. Also the uh, interaction with the environment, uh, uh, production against radiation. So you see also that there is a lot of elements that are similar. 
but there is elements that are uh, that are uh, also specific to the to the IVDR, like the last one, which is protection against the risk posed by devices intended to, intended for self testing or near patient testing. So it's something that is specific there to uh, to the um, to the IVDR. And the last one, only one, which is the number twenty, which is again the labeling. What are the requirements for a information to be provided to uh, to the uh, to the patient or users what are the information to be placed on the label on the packaging on the instruction for use etc etc so as you can see um, the MDR and IVDR and you have maybe identified that the MDR and IVDR really uh, if I can say the, the the requirements one one to the other, one it was not the case between the MDD and the um, IVDD. So here we are seeing that a lot of articles from the MDR are exactly the same with the IVDR, and here you see with the Annex One GSPR some of the elements from GSPR are exactly the same, and you see also with the classification, the chapter for classification for MDR is following the same rules, IVDR is following the same type of rules when before it was a list list A list B uh, that were that were mentioned. Uh, just looking again through these questions. Uh, I hope you're... Uh, so somebody saying, uh, I hope you'll cover 10.4. Um, mm -hmm. It's a hard topic. So if you can just, uh, I don't have it open, so I don't know about how to, which is the, this one. So just tell me again, what is the 10.4? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you please elaborate a label on packaging requirements uh, for device radiation therapy? So, uh, as I've said, for the the label and packaging, um, I don't I, um, no, I cannot open it here now. Uh, but uh, there is a specific requirements specific for uh, each product to say, um, as I've said, on the labeling, what are what is the manufacturer? If the product is sterile, uh, if the product is um, in, uh, used in certain condition, the expiration date, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. This is the requirement that are specifically mentioned, and there is also some logo about radiation. So, if you go to the to the the ISO, the the EN requirements or the the standard for the labeling, you can see that there is some specific also logo about radiation protection against radiation, etc. So, this is something that you can, you have also to place on the on the lab label itself. But um, as each device is different, uh, you have really to look at uh, the, the part 23 to see exactly what are the requirements for your product uh, that are applicable to your product. And then you can you can really, you have really to follow that. They are not specifically saying you have to put this or you have to put that. You have to make this evaluation and you have to decide if this is important to put there or not. If your product is emitting some radiation, then maybe it's important to inform the patient because uh, it can be life-threatening. If it is, um, if the in, if the product can be impacted by the radiation of other elements, then it's also something that maybe you should have to uh, to uh, to to put there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it depends really on each device because you will not put the same logo for as of the scalpel and for a pacemaker and for a wheelchair and for uh, any other device. So each device has its own requirements. So you have really to evaluate your product following the 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 requirements mentioned on the on the GSPR. Uh, let me check if there is something else. Collection. Yeah, I'm curious also this uh, thing. So, uh, uh, check it out. Okay. Okay. Demonstration of compliance. I will. I will go to that. So, um, let me go to that. So, how to document the GSPR? Um, so the GSPR, as you've seen, is just a, a list of requirements. What we are doing and what I'm proposing, and it's also something I will show you, I have created a template for that. What we are doing is something like that. So we have the GSPR ID, so number seven, for example, which is the device shall be designed, manufactured, and packaged in such a way that their characteristic and performance um, are not affected by the transport, etc., storage condition, etc. And what we are doing is that we are mentioning here first, is it applicable? Yes. Um, and then what is the method that I'm using to show conformity to this requirement? And then at the end, um, rational, if the, in the case it's not really applicable. So in that uh, method of uh, conformity, what we are doing is that, for example, if there is an ISO standard that is existing, 
Then we are mentioning that we are, for, for example, I am ISO 13485 certified, so I have a quality management system. So by doing that, I have a system that is really checking, monitoring that every product that I place on the market or every product that I produce are following this requirement through this procedure, maybe of that. I will show you uh, all the different methodology that we can use to show conformity. Um, second, for example, ISO 14971 for risk management, um, EN 1041 for the information supplied to the manufacturer. Uh, here are the symbols that are used with the medical device, uh, labeling information, etc. Et so these are standards that you maybe are complying with. I say maybe because it's important you comply, you confirm that you comply with the standard. So if there is a standard saying, do this, do that, do that, you have really to do what it says on the standard to show to the auditor that you are complying to that. There is also um, guidelines. So MedDev, MDCG now guidelines that are existing. So you can also list them and say, to do that, I comply to this standard or to this guideline or to this, uh, this uh, guidance that is existing. And this is something that you can put here directly within the conformity uh, conformity method. So in terms of standard, what can be really important for you to understand is that there are some harmonized standards. So harmonized standards is standards that are, um, if I can say, recognized by the European Union. Uh, so here I put the links for the three uh, harmonized standards uh, for the NDD, AIMDD, and IVDD. Why? Because there is no standard existing for the rest for now. So when you go to this standard, for to this uh, list, they will show you, for example, ISO 13485 um, is an harmonized standard. 14971 is an harmonized standard, etc., etc. This is applicable for the MDD 9342EC, or this is applicable for the AIMDD, etc. Et so if you show compliance to this standard, Normally, notified bodies or anybody cannot say anything. You are complying to an harmonized standard, so it's fine. There is okay. If there is no harmonized standard for compliance that that is really talking about uh, your topic or the requirements that you need, you can use the other standard. Even if it's not harmonized, you can use them. It's better to use a standard than to create your own method because um, at the end, if there is even no standard at all for your products or your methodology, you can create your own method. The only thing is the fact that the notified body or the auditors will have a bigger scrutiny about this standard, what it is. They may agree with the, you using the standard or they may not agree because they think maybe there is another standard that is better for that. They may agree with your internal methodology or they may not agree also. So this is the danger of not using harmonized standard is the fact that the auditor or notified body can still have some questions or raise some questions which can be difficult to answer because there is no kind of standard that is existing. So it's also something that you have to understand and that you may maybe have some difficulty with. If we go to the MDR, I had also a lot of questions. People are saying, oh, um, I want to be MDR compliant, but there is no harmonized standard that is existing. Yes, there is no harmonized standard actually. They are trying to build that. There was a mandate that was issued to the CN and CN, uh, CNELEC CNELEC, um, for issuing harmonized standards for the NDR and uh, the IVDR. Um, I tried to find again this document on the website, but uh, here I put for you uh, here the standardization mandate database where you can go and you look at all the mandates. And normally this one, which is the M565 should be there, but I didn't find it again. So I don't know if they repealed that or what happened. But normally the European Commission is now issued a standardization mandate for the, uh, those, uh, those entities to create MDR, uh, MDR harmonized standards. Um, I don't know what is exactly their timeline to answer to this mandate. I don't know if they, it's already maybe answered and it's, if maybe already started. But uh, as soon as they are starting, as soon as they issue in that, they will create then the same kind of list that what you have here on the MDD 9342EC, AI, MDD, and IVDD. They will create two. They will create one for the MDR and one for the IVDR. And then as soon as they are harmonized, you can use them specifically. But now, today, uh, there are no harmonized standards for MDR, 
But it doesn't mean that you cannot use the ISO 13485. It doesn't mean that you cannot use the ISO uh, 14971. Uh, it can mean that you cannot use the all other ISO that are already uh, in the harmonized list. It means that you can use them. Um, but if they are harmonized, it's better. It doesn't mean that they have no value anymore or this or that. It's just that it's better when they are harmonized because there is less question. But if they are not harmonized, you can still go and ask, I mean, put them on your, on your, on your GSPR and use them. I doubt that the ISO 13485 will not be harmonized. I doubt that the ISO 14971 for risk management will not be harmonized. So, um, I mean, <laughs> we never know, maybe, but, uh, but I doubt that there, there is this thing. Um, let me check again. Uh, yeah, um, this is a good question. Is the method of conformity, uh, in, the meth in the method of conformity, uh, do we need to mention the year of the standard? Um, I would normally say no, <laughs> because in case there is a change of the of the year, then you have uh, to update again. But normally, yes, um, because normally within your um, quality management system, you have some kind of regulatory update process that should exist. So it means that if tomorrow you go from ISO 13485 version 2012, and tomorrow there is a new publication, which is ISO 13485 2016, you cannot say that you are complying to 2016 um, when you are not, if I can say. Uh, so if, for example, you have still the uh, GSPR or the essential requirements or the GSPR that are still mentioning 2000 uh, without standard, the auditor will ask you, um, I see that you haven't updated the, the, the GSPR or the, um, and the essential requirements since 2015. From there, there was... A, Standard ISO 2013-45-2016. You haven't done any updates. Have you really made a, a check of all those standards? Have you really made an update? I, I'm always seeing some customers that uh, when I ask them to send me their essential requirements or their GSPR, that they have not really the right version of the standards. And then it's raised the question, are you really complying to the new version? So um, the answer to the question is, Yes, you should have that. If you don't have that, it can raise a lot of questions because maybe you will have then to be sure that you are updating really the document uh, as often as possible to really uh, reflect the, uh, the the new version of each of the standards. Um, to demonstrate service, should both the operating procedure and the report be indicated here? Yeah. So I will I will show you now the next step. So um, there is. Harmonized standard, as I said, okay, let's let's go back a bit further. So this is the first methodology, standard is one of the methodology. Guideline is another one. Uh, for example, if we are talking about clinical evaluation uh, report, or if we are trying to be compliant to a clinical evaluation uh, requirements, we can maybe mention the MedDev 2.7 slash uh, 1 revision 4, uh, or the, MD, uh, the new MDCG 2020-6, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we can mention that. but. Um, this is something that is one piece of the answer. Then the other piece, uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I told you also that there is the MedDev uh, directly. So I, I put also the link here if you want to get that. The other piece is procedures. Um, you have a quality management system. Example, we talked about the ISO 14971, which is the ISO for risk management. Then you have you can also show that you have an SOP for the risk management procedure. Uh, you have um, SOP for creation of a packaging material. You have an SOP for the inspection and release of finished product. This shows also that, okay, you have an ISO, but you are also um, following the requirements of the ISO by having a procedure that is existing on your quality management system, and you need a procedure for risk management on a quality management system. Uh, so it's something that you have also to list there. So procedures are also another way to show compliance, but it means that also that you are really following your procedure. You cannot just place the SOP number here and uh, then not following what is written inside. So it's important because the auditor will ask you the question. Okay, can you show me this procedure? Oh, in this procedure, it's written that. Can you show me the documents that you are writing for, writing for that, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important that you are going through this. You have the ISO. You are now then having the procedures existing. And 
In terms of procedures, um, as I've said, uh, there is the ISO 13485, for example. I, I've showed you during a uh, last uh, episode on my podcast how to get ISO 13485 certified. Um, and you have seen also that inside there is also the QMS procedures that need to be ans to answer the uh, GSPR requirements. So you have to have some QMS procedures existing within your quality management system that are already uh, MDR compliant. So if you are ISO 13485, you are not automatically complying to the EU MDR because there is still some articles or some procedures that are mentioned on the MDR that are not listed on the ISO 13485. So it's why just saying I am complying to the ISO 13485 and I have only the procedures of the ISO 13485 will not be sufficient. You have also to include in those procedures some additional requirements that are mentioned on the MDR. So you have also to be careful on that, to not just go from uh, the previous procedure that were was written maybe three or four years ago and to use it still for the new MDR without looking at if there is any modification to that. So be careful that um, any ISO you mention, any procedure you mention, you are really following that and it's really complying to the requirements of the, of the MDR or IVDR. Um, a question here saying, have the, MedDev, have the specific MedDev been updated? Um, the MedDev was normally specifically for the MDD and um, this is not, I mean, MDD or IVDD, but it's not something specific to the MDR. For MDR, it's more the MDCG that are used now, but I'm not sure if they will continue to update the, uh, the MedDev now. The thing is that the MedDev were updated as long as the MDD is still uh, applicable, but now normally the MC MDCG is the next group that is taking uh, in place the role for creation of the, of the, of the guidance. So as soon as you have a new guidance, you always see that it's an MDCG guidance. It's not a, a MedDev guidance anymore. But in certain MDCG guidance, like the 2020-6, which is about clinical uh, sufficient clinical data, um, you can see that it's mentioning the MedDev uh, for clinical evaluation report. So they are still they are still mentioned inside the new guidance, but it's not something I don't think they will update again the MedDev until next year. I, maybe there is one or two that will be updated because the MDD is still applicable until next year, but I doubt there will be any update for that. Uh, okay. Uh, ISO 1345, we talked about that. One question about that. Do you need, do you need ISO 1345 for class one products? Um, you can have it. It's not a problem, but there is no certification needed for that. There is no notified body that will be looking at that. So what we are always asking is to really comply to the EUMDR class one, which is article 10, uh, paragraph nine, which is showing you exactly what are the requirements that you need to follow for the uh, ISO 13, uh, for, not for the ISO 13485, for the quality management system. So if you are ISO 13485, it's good, but it's not really a mandatory requirement for that. But it's mandatory to have a quality management system. It's mandatory to have uh, the procedures mentioned on the Article 10, uh, Paragraph 9, but it's not specifically mandatory to be certified ISO 13485 for Class 1. Okay, the last part is about uh, the reports. So we talked about ISO uh, procedures, uh, standards. Uh, we talked about uh, guidelines. We talked about um, quality management system procedures. Here, we have now the next level, which is the reports. Um, if you are trying to test if your product is capable to survive or to, to work uh, within a certain period, until a certain expiry date, you have to, for example, have some stability tests pro, uh, reports from certain laboratories. Uh, you have also maybe to make some report uh, about transportation to what we are we are doing in some companies is that we had the test, we, we deliver one product from one place to another place and see if there is any damage on the product. So it's some tests that we are doing. You have also some laboratory tests. So you can do internal tests if you have internal labor or internal protocols and they are really compliant. You can also use laboratory tests if you are some ISO to, that should be followed and you don't have the good laboratory practices on your at your company, but you know a laboratory that is accredited for that and then it can help you, then you can get the report from there. Um, but what the laboratory is doing is one thing. 
the conclusion that you get from these laboratories and other things. So what we advise is always that we have the report from the laboratory and you create your own report with the conclusion about what the laboratory says. Does it really follow the requirements that you were expecting, yes or no? And you have a report that is showing that. You have also the internal formulas. So you have the reports, you have the internal formulas that you can, can create, like the risk management file, where you identify all the risks for the such products. Um, the packaging design also, you have maybe a form saying, for this product, I, uh, for this packaging, I will use this logo because it's sterile. I will use this logo because it's uh, expiration date. I will use this logo because there is an uh, authorized representative, etc., etc. So you have maybe a, a form like a checklist with all the requirements and you say i will follow this and will follow that what is good is to create this kind of checklist or form um, that is really listing all the elements about the um, the gspr 23 or gspr 20 for the uh, ivdr uh, and then you can have all the elements inside and here you can say yes the information i provide to the customer are correct and they are following uh, the gspr requirements um, you have also the product packaging, maybe uh, the IFU, the label. So you can also list that as an evidence that yes, I'm providing the right information to my patient, to, to, to the people, and here is uh, here are the documents. Uh, okay. Next step is okay. Accredited laboratory. So it, this is also something important. It's why I told you, even if you receive a report from an accredit from a laboratory, first, I mean, first, normally on your quality management system procedures, you have to verify that this laboratory is really capable to do what you are asking them to do. So the fact that they are accredited for a certain standard is good, uh, but you have to verify that it's not something that uh, uh, you have just to assume because on their website they said, yes, we are capable to do the test for uh, biological compatibility, biocompatibility, or this or that. You have to check that they are really accredited for that. And even if they are accredited, you receive the report, they will give you some conclusion. You have to interpret those conclusions following your information. Um, is it really that uh, that you are expecting? Is the report really mentioning all the elements that you are um, that are, are applicable to your device, etc. Et so you should not just get the report and put it on your uh, dossier or put it on the GSPR, you should maybe also make a conclusion report that saying, uh, we had this protocol number, blah, blah, for this test, we had this result, and it's following our protocol, and we approve that, etc. So you can have also a report that is really making a summary of all what was done to uh, arrive to this compliance. So um, internal forms, as I said, should be also, uh, can also be used, but you have to be careful. If there is a specific ISO standard, you have also to prove that the people that were issuing those reports or uh, issuing those elements are understanding those documents because the auditor can ask you a lot of questions. And if you are not qualified, then they can arrest the, the question and say, okay, maybe you are not the right person to talk with, or maybe this company doesn't have qualified people for this type of, of elements. So you have always to yeah, be careful uh, about that. One question that I received today uh, is about um, clinical evaluation report. Um, and I raised this question to uh, my guest of my next podcast, uh, and you will see that on Monday. It's about clinical evaluation report. Um, what is the link between clinical evaluation report and uh, essential requirements or GSPR? In the MedDev, for example, it specifically said uh, in the MedDev for clinical evaluation report, it specifically said you have to follow to show compliance to the essential requirements number one, uh, three, and six. Um, and I for AIMDD also, uh, for AIMDD also. I will just show you now here, yeah. So um, you have the MDD that is saying you have to follow the requirements for uh, year one, year three, and year six. For AIMDD for year one, year two, and year five, which is the essential requirements. But what is it for uh, GSPR? So for GSPR, you have to follow um, as a minimum number one and number eight. Because when you are making a, um, a review of the, MD, the essential requirements and of the GSPR, you see that the number one, three, and six are compatible with the number one and eight of the GSPR. And uh, the thing is, you have to understand also that it's not sufficient. Um, when you look at the MDCG guidance, the new MDCG guidance regarding um, compatible uh, legacy devices, clinical data for legacy devices, they never mentioned the number one and number eight. They never mentioned that. When on the MedDev, they mentioned specifically the number one, number three, number six. 
for clinical evaluation code. In the MD, in, in the MDCG, they say you have to choose which GSPR is really compliant for the clinical your clinical evaluation report. So as I've said, for me, when, when we study that as a minimum, the number one and eight should be followed. But for example, if your product is part of the Annex 16, then number nine is also has to be followed. If your product has some medicinal product inside, then another uh, GSP has to be followed. So it will depend on uh, the type of product. It will depend on a lot of things. So um, don't be surprised if on maybe on some uh, clinical evaluation report for under the MDR, there will be some additional additional GSPR that will be listed. It's just because you have really to check which GSPR is really applicable to, to you. So you see here, even when you will build your G, uh, clinical evaluation report, the GSPR is really a central piece because you have to show compliance to all one of those requirements that are maybe talking about clinical evaluation. Okay. Um, okay, so you ask this about how to start a new project. This is my own recommendation. I uh, will not say that there is any standard or anything that is doing that. It's just from my experience and how we are working within projects. And we discussed also about that, um, uh, some of those elements that I will show you, we discussed about that on other, uh, other videos or other uh, podcasts. So what I will first start with is with the bad practices. As, uh, as we said is that, uh, we wait first that the project is finished. We say, okay, I mean, it's, it's always what is happening sometimes is that we are involving a lot of engineers, a lot of uh, people that are designing, creating, testing, doing the project. And at the end, we, we froze everything and we say, hey, can we have a, a regulatory affairs person or a quality person to help us to comply now to the requirements and to register the products in uh, to uh, CE marking? It's a bit too late. For me, really, you have to involve regulatory or quality people really at the beginning so that they can guide you really on the right direction uh, from, from there. Um, you contact the consultant or you contact uh, any regulatory person and you think that the GSPR can be provided as quick as possible, I mean, quickly. You, I, I hope that you understood now when you look at all the elements of the GSPR. You have to understand your, the quality management system of the company. You have to understand the design dossier, how the product is, what is the product, what it is for, uh, its intended purpose, how the manufacturing process is done. You have to understand which standard it follows. You have to understand the CR, the PMS. I mean, you have to understand all those things so you can really work on the GSPR. If you don't understand anything of that, you cannot just call a consultant from one day to another and say, hey, by next week, can you, f can you send me the GSPR for my products? I mean, no, it's not working like that. And you should be surprised if somebody says, yes, I will do that. Um, one thing that I always see <laughs> also <laughs> is that uh, we have some companies that are filling the GSPR with standards that they are not following at all. <laughs> they just fill that because they think it's it's fancy or everybody's putting ISO 13485, so I put that there. I mean, you can put ISO 13485 even if you are not certified ISO 13485. You just have to show to the auditor that yes, you are, uh, you have a CAPA system, you have a risk management uh, system, etc. Et I mean, this is mainly for class one. If you are um, class 2A to B3, certification for ISO 13485 is recommended. I will not say mandatory because as I said, a standard is voluntary. So you can use whatever uh, elements you need to show that you have a quality management system. But um, ISO 13485 is an harmonized standard. It's the preferred standard. So uh, to avoid any issue, to avoid a lot of question, be ISO 13485 certified will be easier for you uh, if you if you are uh, working with a notified body. But don't say that you are complying, for example, to ISO 14971 when you are not, or to uh, the ISO related to biocompatibility when you have no biocompatibility report, or to the ISO related to cleaning or to stability when there is no stability report, because the auditor will ask you anyway. So they will find it that you don't have that. So, and it's worse. They will think, okay, they are trying to, they are, they are lying on me. So they, I will not be able to, to provide them the certificate. So I saw that. It's why I'm, I'm telling you, don't play this game with auditors. If you are putting that there, it means that you are really uh, following that. Um, what we are doing is that the best practice, as 
we mentioned in one of the previous episodes is always to start with the intended purpose of your device. Uh, I had this workshop done with uh, Cesare Magri, and the idea is mainly that better you understand your products, better you can really go to the next step. So first, go through the intended purpose, write the intended purpose. So the intended purpose will mention which population, what is the medical indication, what is the contraindication, the warnings, etc. So all this, you can make a brainstorming and we are giving you, uh, you see here the download pack, uh, you, we are giving you some documents or some elements that you can use uh, to uh, to create this intent purpose. And during this workshop, we give you some examples. So go back to that. Uh, you can also contact Cesare Magri from uh, Beyond Clinical. And uh, he has a, a lot of tools and a lot of ideas uh, re regarding that. So I think this episode was really great if you really want to understand how to write, uh, write that. Then, um, the next best practice, I call that the three steps. You have first to identify, to qualify. And now that you know the product, you know the intended purpose, you know everything. Now it's time to qualify first. Is it really a medical device? Because I have also a lot of clients that come to me and say, I want to have this product CE marked on your medical device. But when I look at it, it's not a medical device. So first, give me the more information. What is the intended purpose? And then we can tell you, yes, it is or it is not a medical device. When you know that it is a medical device, you go for the classification of your device. It's a class one, two A, two B, three, because it tells you exactly which requirements you will have to follow. And then you know which conformity assessment route you need to go. So it's mainly, I want to go for a full quality management system a review or a type examination, et cetera, et cetera. So you decide, but it depends also on the classification of your product. If you are class one, it's self-certification. So there is no need of notified body. You just need to have a technical documentation. You need to have a quality management system. You need to have following the minimum requirements for the MDR, and then you can place your device on the market. But for others, you have many routes that are uh, possible. And after that, you can start with the GSPR. So this is also something that is important is that now that you have a better understanding of your products, now you can start with the GSPR. And I will show you how specifically. And yeah, um, I had also this workshop or this uh, case study uh, episode where we discussed about how to classify a medical device. Uh, so um, you can go to to that, and I we give it was it was made on a quiz episode. Like uh, I give you some examples, and I ask you to classify them so you can you can see uh, if you if if you know how to do that. I mean, it's it's more for practicing and, and practicing. So uh, you can go to that. So what I'm asking you is mainly that you, what you can do is use your GSPR template or your GSPR checklist as your tool for guiding you on what is the, the, the activities that you have to perform. For example, let's take again the example of number seven, uh, which is a device uh, shall be designed, manufactured and packaged in such a way that uh, it's not damaging, damaged during transport and storage. So the question you have to ask yourself with that is, how can I comply to these requirements? And then here from it's kind of a brainstorming. You, you are with your team and you say, how can I comply to that? And people are saying, oh, let's do this test. Let's do that thing. Let's follow this standard. Let's follow this procedure. Let's follow that. So then you list all these things together. Uh, this is important because this is also opening your mind and say, here is the thing. You can still eliminate, as I've said, it's a brainstorming. So you can still list everything. During a brainstorming, you should not censure anybody. So there is no. So if somebody says something crappy, you should write it anyway. So because uh, it's the methodology, and after that, you can really make a thing. Say no, this one is not possible, or this one we should remove it, or which one uh, we should regroup that with others. So it's really the methodology. Um, and then when you are answering all those questions, from there you should have an action plan that is starting to be built. For example, during the design phase, I need to follow the standard X for stability study. So then your activity is to create uh, this uh, test to get maybe the right laboratory for that, uh, to get the report. And then as soon as you have that, then you can say, I tick the box and say, this one is finished. So status is uh, it's, it's completed. And here are, for example, all the action plan. And here you can put also the responsible person. You can put also put the timeline, when this should be available, etc. It's really based on a project. You are really doing that like a project. So you can use this template or the template that, uh, that, that is existing to use it like a project uh, project basis. So, and there you go from 
um, GSPR1 is for this person to work on, the GSPR2 is for this person, and as a team, you see what is the progress of all this to arrive to the end. And this is how I would recommend you to go through that, and it's why I say to you, don't start a GSPR review at stage when the design is frozen or when you are arriving nearly to market. No, start it at the beginning. The same as intended purpose should be at the beginning. The same as risk management file should be at the beginning. It's, it's a living document, so it's a document that is living, but it should be starting at the beginning. Uh, okay. And then, as I've told you, when you have the GSPR, I mean, I don't know if you had already a review by an auditor, but the auditor will open the GSPR and will start asking you a question about that. And I just made a few questions that, that you can see how it is working. Um, so, for example, GSPR 3, which is about risk management. So you are mentioning that you are complying to the ISO 14971. Can you please show me the risk management procedure, the plan for your device, the risk management report with the result of your assessment? This is the type of, of question that you can get from an auditor if you are showing compliance to uh, the ISO 14971, for example. On your post-marketing report, you identify some risk. Have you updated your risk management file to verify if the risk is a risk score is changing. So normally when you are making your risks, you define, for example, the risk of probability of an issue is uh, low, the risk of the severity is high, the occurrence is uh, this uh, thing, etc. Et so at the end, it gives you a score. But if you receive a lot of complaints about this specific risk, it means that the probability is not low anymore, it is maybe high or it is moderate, then you have to update your score. And this is the thing that they can ask you. They can look at your risk management file. The risk management file was not updated since 2012, for example. And you can say, OK, it's not maybe not a living document. Maybe they are still using the, the data that they got from 2012. And they didn't use the data for, from the PMS, from the complaints to update that file. And this is an example. If your date of creation is two or three years ago, it's a, a sign for an auditor to say, oh, maybe they are not really following uh, the requirements here. Uh, where are you analyzing your ratio benefit risk and why do you consider it positive? So benefit risk ratio will be a big question and we discussed about that on other episodes. Um, so it's something that you have also to show, for example, in your clinical evaluation report that you are making the evaluation of your risk of your benefit and say that it's better to have this product than not to have it because the benefits are higher than the risk. So this is a discussion on how you will do that. I see a lot of people that are just putting one sentence um, kind of standard to say, yes, my benefit is higher than my risk, so I consider that my product is, is good. Yes, but how do you do that? There is no real justification. So please be careful also on that. If we go, for example, to the GSPR 23.1, um, which is about instruction for use, so your product is not accompanied by an instruction for use. What is the reason? For example, you have a product and it looks and there is no instruction for use with it. What is the reason? What you can say is specifically, oh, we are using now an EIFU, electronic IFU, and it's authorized. Uh, here is the elements, here is how it's working, here is the procedure for that, etc., etc. So you can have some good reason for that. So you just have to have that in mind. Which standard are you using for the symbols on the label? So there is maybe a standard that you are using. And what you can do, you can say, oh, you are using this standard, but on this standard, it's not this logo, it's this one. So you have also to be careful because there is two standards that are uh, on symbols, so you have to use the, the right one also. Can you show me your procedure for the creation of label and how you choose what to put on it? So as I've said, when you are creating a label for first-time products, you can have maybe a procedure to say, uh, for a sterile product, I would put this, for uh, this, I would put that, etc. So it can ask you, show me your procedure, show me your form specifically for this product, show me the label that you have to see that what you decided on the form was really what is on the label, etc., etc. As I've said, this tool, this GSPR uh, tool can be used for projects, can be used for an audit, can be used for a lot of things. It's why it's really the central piece of your project. If you are really having this document, if you are really having all the information uh, listed there, if you are really looking one by one what it is, you can really succeed with uh, an audit or you can succeed with your project because here, this helps you to create all the pieces that you need uh, for uh, placing your, for, for being compliant to the, the, to the NDR. Um, and it's why also don't make it like a, an easy task. 
take it really like a project. It's a project really for you to 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 be to be placing that uh, to be uh, complying with the GSPR. Um, Okay, yeah, last question. When we reviewed risk, we identified some residual risk. Are there communicated to the user? Where can I see that? So yeah, you have some residual risk. It says that you have to communicate that to your user. Maybe you are you have that under instruction for you. So let's show under instruction for you that the risk, the residual risk that we identified, maybe this is the residual risk that are coming from this uh, risk management file. This is the ones that are mentioned on the IFU. Imagine tomorrow that you are finding a new residual risk, then you have maybe to change your instruction for use to include that or justify why you didn't uh, you didn't include that there. Okay, a last point is about GSPR templates. So uh, I'm creating some templates and one of them is a GSPR template. It's on my uh, shop, so easymedicaldevice.com slash shop. And you can see specifically that uh, I try to list all the GSPR there. There is, so this is built on three uh, steps. Uh, there is a step where you are uh, having uh, all the information about how to uh, comply to the GSPR. Second is a list of all the uh, all the standards, all the documents that you are using specifically. And number three is uh, then the, all the requirements GSPR 1 to GSPR 23 uh, about how you can follow, follow to that. Okay, let me check quickly if there is something. Uh, should the GSPR be a control document? Yes, I mean, GSPR can be updated. So normally first the GSPR should be on your technical documentation. As I said, it's a piece of the puzzle, so you have to have that on the technical documentation. It is one chapter of the technical documentation. Um, what I'm asking, what I'm doing usually when I'm building a technical file, I put that on Annex 1 of the technical file uh, as a control document also. But it means also that each time you will change this document, it's like updating the, uh, the, the technical documentation because the GSPR should be listed inside your, um, your, uh, your technical documentation. So it should be saying, yeah, uh, you have to go to Annex 1 for uh, finding that. So you have to have also an history why you change the GSPR. You have revision 1, then revision 2, why, uh, what is the change with revision 2? So this is why it should be a control document. You have to make a number of it. You have to make a revision of it. You have to make pages 1, 2, uh, 32, etc. But you have to have a tracking of what changed from version 1 to version 2 to version 3. And the notified body can has also to have this information because if this year it comes and it was version 3 and next year you arrive in version 5, what did change? What is the, the thing? And notified bodies also like to see that there is leaving documents and changing and there is a good reason for that. What they don't like is that to see some documents that were issued 10 years ago and they are still not changed. So it's something that's why you have to show that you are really updating uh, frequently and why you are updating. But if there is any major update of your GSPR, this is maybe one reason for an auditor to review again your technical file. So you have to really identify what is the change. If the change is really a small change because of a typo or because you updated one, uh, one ISO standard, uh, then it's fine. I mean, you have just to explain what is the change and it's fine. But if it's a major change, then you have really to communicate also with the notified body and each notified body is different. So you have to communicate with them. When should I inform you of any change? And then they will tell you, you can inform me on, at that moment or when you arrive to that, uh, that, uh, that situation. Better to communicate with your notified body. I had this case when they were coming to audit me and they said, oh, you didn't inform us about this and you didn't inform us about that. And it's, it's true you have to inform them. So better to inform them and they will say to you, usually what they are saying to me, each time I inform them, they are saying to me, okay, we'll review that during the next uh, audit. So during the next time we are coming for an audit. So it's not like they are reviewing that immediately. It's just like, okay, it's a change, but it's a minor change. You identify that and we'll review that during the next uh, next audit. What I'm saying here is just as I've said to, for you to be on the safe side, but you have really to discuss with your auditors or your notified body to know exactly what are their procedures, what are their strategy, uh, strategy for that. Okay, so uh, thank you for those that are joining. So thank you, Anna, for uh, your things. And thank you, Paul. Yeah, I think another great webcast, so thank you. Uh, uh, the benefit risk ratio, a qualitative analysis. So uh, we discussed about that. The benefit risk ratio. The issue is the fact that um, we discussed about that during uh, another another episode. Uh, we discussed uh, about that thing during the podcast with uh, Robert van Boxtel uh, about clinical uh, clinical data for low risk products. Uh, um, 
so the benefit risk ratio there is no specific standard that is existing uh, there is no specific rule that is existing uh, how to make this uh, there is the pharma industry that has some so we can make a, a kind of a, uh, we can make some kind of uh, um, extrapolation from what they are doing, but it's a pharma industry, so it's not the medical device industry. So it's not like, uh, as I've said, a product like a wheelchair or a pacemaker or a scalpel cannot be evaluated on the, on the same way. So it's why you have really to define your own methodology for that. But you should better to be qualitative and quantitative. Uh, but there is no official method that is existing actually to uh, to evaluate to have a clear evaluation of the benefit risk ratio. So I know it will be difficult because it will be interpretation from the auditors. Uh, some will accept what you will provide, some will not. But try to be logical if I can say in term. Don't just use basic sentences to say yes, my benefit is higher than my uh, my risk, so my product is good. I mean, put a bit more matter uh, about that. For example, if the, if the, if all the risk that you have is like my risk is infection, my risk is uh, this or my risk is that, but the benefit is the fact that if I don't use that, I will die. I mean, it's obvious that the benefit is higher than the risk. The dying is, if I can say, more, is, is, uh, you, it's better to not die than to just get maybe a small infection or a side effect because of this or that. I mean, it's you has really to evaluate that also. Okay. Uh, okay, so thank you everybody. So uh, if you have any question also, so don't hesitate. Uh, here is my phone, here is my email. So just send me an email. Uh, if you have also some other topics that you want me to maybe go through, uh, I will just check some of the elements that you discussed today and maybe create another episode or podcast or maybe a blog specifically about the topics. I will look, look at the Phthalat uh, thing and the CMR uh, guidance and see if there is anything related to that. Uh, but, uh, and maybe make another episode about that. But if there is any other, uh, anything else, let me know. As I said, there is also the templates that I'm creating. So please uh, don't go and check if they, you are interested to, uh, to use them. And if you have any projects uh, for CE marketing for your, for, for your company, so don't hesitate also to contact me. I would be really happy to, to help you. Okay, so I wish you a nice day and uh, have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.